Okay, so in lesson nine, we're going to talk about, uh, again, we talked about yesterday, uh, you know, uh, I think we talked about this yesterday. Um, we talked about ionic bonding. So we got, so far we have metals and non-metals. That's ionic, of course. We're going to look at, we know how to draw the form, we, sorry, we know how to uh, write the formula. We know how to name them, Roman numerals, possibly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know how to draw them as well. Arrows, show electrons moving, brackets, charges, yes. We've done molecular compounds, non-metals, non-metals. So we know how to name those. We know how to write formulas. We use prefixes, right? We also know how to draw them. That was the first part of lesson eight. So we kind of match them up nicely in some kind of nitrogen trihydride. Match CH4 matches up really nicely. Or we can add up the electrons if we had to, okay? Now, so we've taken care of metals, non-metals, non-metals, non-metals. What about metals, metals? And of course, that is an option, okay? All the metals over there are in solid form because, of course, what, whatever is going on there, uh, if we look over there, except for mercury, it's kind of a little goofy, but the rest of them are all in solid form. So that obviously means that they're sticking together pretty well, yes? Right? Uh, there has to be something that's holding all those atoms together. Like, for example, this desk right here is made out of aluminum, yeah? I think. I don't know. Uh, but that aluminum, those aluminums have to be held together really well to be in a solid form. If they weren't, they'd be in a liquid form, yes, like water. And if they were even weaker than that, they'd be in a gas form and they'd be just floating everywhere and we wouldn't have a desk, right? So they have to be held, one atom has to be held to another one, to another one, to another, very well, okay? And that force is called metallic bonding. It happens between the atoms of the same type of element, so aluminum to aluminum to aluminum to aluminum, and it can happen between different elements as well. So, for example, I don't know if we talked about this yesterday, but uh, if you want a, you know, a bronze trophy, you're going to make uh, copper and tin, yes? And you're going to mix them together, and you're going to get this bronze, right? So a mixture of metals, okay, called, called alloys, all right? But that's all done through metallic bonding. So we talked a little bit about yesterday, what is metallic bonding, uh, or what, it, what does it kind of look like here? And I... I didn't get you to copy all this, but it says here, notice that most metals are solids at room temperature, and therefore some type of force has to be present to hold these atoms together. If there were no forces, they wouldn't be in solid form. They'd be liquid if they're weaker, or if they're super weak, they'd be a gas. Okay. All right, now you're going to have to copy this part here, and then we're, we're pretty much done for the copying part today here, uh, as far as that goes. But we're going to talk a little bit about what, what is metallic bonding and what does it look like. We'll do a couple diagrams. Okay, so let's copy this here. I'll give you some time to do that. Um, well, what is metallic bonding? Well, metallic bonding, all the atoms are attracted to all the valence electrons. The valence electrons are delocalized, so that's the first key thing here. So what that means is that delocalized part, and this is an important part, what it means is those valence electrons are kind of set free from the atom that they used to belong to. Okay, so they are delocalized. If you're delocalized, it's mean you don't, you know, you don't maybe don't live here kind of thing anymore. You're living somewhere else or something. You're not there. So the delocalized electrons, they're just kind of set free. They don't necessarily belong to this uh, this this atom anymore. They're kind of set free. They're they're free to move around. Okay, and they're free to move from one atom to the next. So those electrons, not only are they set free, but they're free to kind of move around this structure. Okay, these these a whole bunch of uh, atoms here. You can visualize metallic bonding as a network of positive ions. Okay, in a sea of electrons. So positive ions and a lot of negative electrons. Okay, and we'll we'll show you how that what that looks like right away here. The electrostatic attract or attractive force is a fancy way of saying what? Electrostatic attractive force, what does that really mean? Positive ions, negative electrons, what do you think? Positive ions, negative electrons, what do you, what do you think? What do I always tell you? Electrostatic attractive force, fancy way of saying. Opposites attract yes that's really what they're saying here so opposites attract the opposites attract force is pretty darn strong is what they're trying to tell you between positively charged metal ions metal ions and the sea of negative electrons is what makes up this metallic bond okay positive ions 
negative electrons. That's what the metallic bond is. Okay, so I'm going to show you how this kind of this is a very rudimentary, very very simplistic uh, thing that I'm going to show you here. But basically, hopefully you'll get the idea. Then I'll show you a nice diagram that uh, the uh, that uh, that I have as well. But this one's going to be pretty simple. Okay, good. Okay, so I, I just show I, we could pick any atom. I, I don't know. Maybe do we want to switch it today? I don't know. I was doing potassium in the. I don't know. Let's pick lithium for. Oh, why not? Sure. We're gonna pick lithium. Lithium. Okay. Uh, it has three electrons. Yes. Two. Uh, three protons. Three electrons. Two in the first, one in the second energy level, yes? <clears throat> okay, so here's lithium. There's, uh, and I'm not going to do a Bohr diagram. I'm not going to do anything. Uh, this is not a really a, a true diagram of anything, okay? Uh, or for that matter, I guess we could do sodium or whatever. I did potassium in the other class. It doesn't matter. Um, lithium has how many electrons? How many valence electrons does lithium have? One. Okay, so that's the one I'm going to show you. I don't care about the two protons, two electrons, or anything like that. This is just that one electron. I'm just going to draw it right here. You guys go ahead and draw this too. Lithium, and there's its one valence electron. Okay, lithium, and there's its one valence electron. I'm going to do four across the top, and I'm going to do three down here. And I'm just showing you this one just because it's kind of easiest this would happen with any valence electrons any metal part okay i could have i could have uh threw a couple aluminums in there if i wanted to just for fun skis you know uh, but we'll just kind of keep it simple here okay so i drew seven atoms and of course each one of those atoms has one valence electron so what happens is lithium okay is going to let go of that electron it's basically going to delocalize it in other words that lithium Okay, this electron here isn't going to belong just to this. Uh, that electron there is not going to just belong to that lithium anymore. It's going to be free to start roaming. Okay, so when that electron leaves and is free to roaming, what do we end up with? Do we still have lithium atoms? We have lithium ions now, yes. Okay, so I'm going to redraw this now down here. So I'm going to pretend that that electron is gone, okay, or, or, or is moving somewhere, okay? And same with this one here for right now, and same with this one, and same with this one, okay? And same with these ones. Uh, I'm not sure where the electrons went, but again, I'm just going to say, okay, uh, there's my seven lithium ions now, okay? Those electrons are kind of set free. They're delocalized from that atom, okay? Now, where are those electrons? Well, they're free to move throughout this entire substance here. So they're free to move around, okay? Uh, they might still be roughly in the same spot. So I'm just going to throw up, look, we have seven ions. I'm going to throw up seven electrons somewhere, okay? And they're kind of free to move. So I'm going to put one there, one there. I don't know. I'm going to put one uh, here, okay? Uh, there, 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 and there, okay, something like that, okay, I don't know, whatever, doesn't matter, okay, so we got these electrons that are free to move throughout this solid chunk of a lithium, okay, and what we end up with is a positive electrostatic attraction, yes, uh, basically meaning opposites attract, so this positive ion is attracted to this electron, and you might say, well, well, geez, that looks exactly kind of like the one up there. It is. And, you know, maybe this one here is attracted to this, and this one here is attracted to that, and that's there, and that's there, and that's there, and that's there. So maybe they're attracted to those electrons there, okay? And you might say, well, what would he do? That almost, doesn't that kind of almost make them neutral again in a way kind of thing, right? Because if there's that attraction there, maybe that electron is still there, yeah, kind of thing? And maybe they're still what, somewhat neutral. But remember, they're free to move, so maybe that electron is moved somewhere else. But here's where it becomes a little interesting. Because those electrons move throughout the whole entire substance, not only is this lithium ion attracted to this electron, but this lithium ion is also attracted to that electron. Okay? In other words, they're not attracted to just, just one electron again. They might be attracted to any electron that's near them. 
So for example, this one here would be probably attracted to that and that's attracted to that and that could be attracted to that and that could be attracted to that and that may be there and that may be there and that may be there and there. Maybe there, maybe that's maybe it's not close enough in this particular. You got to remember these electrons are going super fast, so it may be right not right now, but in in about a uh, five hundredth of a billion second, uh, it will be. Okay, so we get all of these. All of a sudden, we get all of these electrostatic attractions. We get way more. Look, there's seven seven ions I drew here. How many attractions do we have in these seven ions? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty. Sure, ish, 20 ish, yeah, in those seven ions. Well, again, seven ions, probably a little low, you know. Uh, how would we figure out, you know, we could go to the lab, we could cut off a ch chunk of lithium, we could put it on the scale, we could weigh it, that'd be the mass, yes. You remember this from science 10? Mass, molar mass, right? We could figure out N. And then, yes, the moles, we call that the moles or amount. We could take that and times it by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And guess what? There's going to be, answer, lots. Okay. Probably a little bit more than seven. Like, uh, I'm going to say, throw this number out there, a billion. That's a made up number. Okay. But there's going to be lots. Like 6.02 times 10 to 23, that's 602 sextillion, yes? So maybe it's only a pentillion atoms that we have. Maybe it's only a quadillion pen, uh, atoms that we have. That's uh, a little bit more than trillion, okay? But we're going to have lots, right? So how many opposites attract are we going to have? Plus, minus, plus, minus, positive ion, negative electron? Lots, okay? Yes? So that's what the that opposites, that's what that positive ion negative electron attraction looks like. And there's going to be the billions of them attractions, okay? There's going to be so many attractions. And that's what holds them together because it's not only this lithium that's attracted to this electron, it's this one here. So now they're kind of connected together. And that opposites attract really wants to, you know, magnets. They want to bring them together. And that's why most of the metals are at solid, uh, solids under room temperature, okay? Um, and like I said, that's only that many, seven. Look at this one here. This is an example of magnesium, okay? And again, there's only 32 atoms here. 32, well, 32 atoms that have let go of their electrons, two valence electrons, let go of two valence electrons. And now we have 32 positive ions that are attracted to this, any electron that's around it, okay? And again, if you want a qu quick little uh, thing here, look. We got that. This is in Google Classroom, by the way. So if you're like, I really like that diagram, I'd sure like it. Uh, you go to Google Cloud, there's one in behind there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, you go to Google Classroom and it, it'll be there for you. All right. Um, and that's just, I don't know, that's roughly, I guess there's probably a little bit there too. Okay. Um, those are all the electrostatic. And remember, those aren't bonds, they're just opposites attract. Yes. Okay. So their opposites attract, and that's what holds them together. It's not like a covalent bond there or anything like that, uh, by, by no means, okay? Uh, but even if I just did that on that row of eight, there's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26 attractions there on eight, okay? Think about this. How many in 32 here? Lots, yes? Already it's over, easily over 100, guaranteed. I don't. I didn't count them, but I'm just going to go with that. There's probably over a hundred. Now remember, 32. That's it. Okay, we have over a hundred attractions. Think about this is one layer. Think about that coming out from the board, going into the board, going up, going down. Right? Atomic level kind of stuff here. There's going to be billions of attractions, trillions, quadrillions, pentillions, sextillion, more than that. Okay. There's going to be, like I say, a billion, which is a made-up number, by the way. There's going to be lots of attractions, and that's what holds together really well. These electrons are free to move, so they are free to move within this kind of construct here, right? They're free to move within these ions, and anytime they're close to another positive ion, there's going to be an attraction there. 
and that's why they're also conductive. Metals are conductive, right? We know that from our second quiz, I think. Metals are great conductors of electricity because we have positive ions and we have these electrons that move throughout this, you know, throughout this structure, and that's how we conduct electrical current, okay? Metals are great conductors. Ion compounds are great conductors when you put them into water and they separate that charge, yes? Because there's that freedom of positive negative stuff. Same thing here. Those electrons are free to move. And so that's why they're in solid form. Lots and lots of positive negative attractions. We have to remember this though. When we talk about ionic, it's positive ion, negative ion, right? Metal, non-metal, positive negative. When we talk about metallic, there's no non-metals. So it's positive ion, electron, right? Going around and moving around, stuff like that. That's kind of how they're different, yet kind of the same in a way. If you, did we talk about the pizza uh, temperature? Shake and bake? No? Okay. If you put a pizza in the oven, like I did last night, I, I put it in at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what you cook pizza at. Yeah. Right? 400 Fahrenheit on the stove. 400. Which is about 200 Celsius. Okay? 200 Celsius. Um. When you open up the oven door and you go to check the pizza, you stick your head in there to look at the pizza, yes? No. Well, maybe, I don't know, okay? Maybe that's, again, maybe that's natural selection. I'm not sure. But, you know, you open up the pizza door, oven, and you like, you know, it's hot, right? That's 200 Celsius, okay? Most ionic compounds, most, are kind of start around that 800 degrees Celsius for melting them. Positive ion, negative ion, hold together really well, yes? 800 degrees Celsius, that's four ovens. So if you can imagine that, you know, having four ovens lined up or all in the same oven, cranking that sucker up, that's going to be hot, right? That's how much energy it takes to melt an ionic compound, roughly, give or take some, okay? Metals are no different, same thing. It takes like... 600, 700, usually 800, somewhere in there to melt them in some cases. Yeah, there's some that are lower. Same with the ionic compound. I'm just saying, okay? Um, like sodium chloride, I think, is about 800 Celsius. Okay, if you wanted to melt the table salt, you'd have to heat up the oven to 800 Celsius to melt it. Okay, not put it in water, just melt it. Okay? Molecular compounds, we're going to learn, are sharing, yes? And I hate to say this, Sharing might be caring, but it's weak, okay? Sharing's weak because sharing, look, water. Water melts at zero, right? It's already turned to a liquid. At 100, it boils already, okay? So that's kind of the difference we're talking about here. Molecular compounds are pretty weak, okay, due to intermolecular forces. Ionic metallic, very strong. Okay, those opposites attract is super strong. Okay, and that's all I got to say about metallic bonding. Okay, so that's the third type of bonding. Okay, good. Sure.